Today we will discuss uh, some basic principles in paternal endocrinology. So let's try to share my screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, so you can see me also, or you can see only the. We can see, we can also see you a little bit and the presentation. Ah, okay, perfect. So, let's start with the presentation. Can we hear you? <laughs> so, paternal geochronology can be considered as a set of strategic approaches to the research of the age of the material, the geofeature, or a geological event. I'm not sure if you can hear me correctly. Θα σε βάλω λίγο πιο δυνατά. Τώρα νομίζω θα σε εντάξει. Για πάμε. So let's start from the beginning. Quaternal geochronology can be considered as a set of strategic approaches to the research of the age of the material, the nature, or the geological event. The approaches and the methods can be different in theoretical level, in the type of the results, and the geological setting that they apply. Some of the methods are using high technological equipment, and others can produce results with simple field measurement. Uh, no single method uh, has emerged, that is applicable throughout the quaternary to common material of this age. Thus, there is a necessity for various strategies and methods to be developed for the interpretation of a geological problem. Uh, we have a lot of methods of quaternal geochronology. Some of them we can see here. Uh, we have more than uh, 30 methods uh, which can refer to a geological problem. Uh, today we will discuss about general chronology, about chronology, radio carbon, uranium series chronology, and luminescence chronology. Uh, those chronologies are the most uh, useful uh, chronologies in uh, contemporary geology and geology at the moment. Uh, the other uh, methods, we can use them occasionally. Uh, regarding the geological problem that we have to solve. Let's talk a little bit about the classification of the Quaternary geochronological methods. The first classification is by the type of the method. So we have the site real methods, which determine calendar dates or countdown events. We have these isotopic methods, which measure changes in isotopic composition due to radioactive decay or growth. We have the radiogenic methods which measure cumulative effects of natural radioactive decay, such as crystal damage and electron energy traps. We'll talk about that later. Chemical and biological methods which measure the results of time-dependent chemical or biological processes. Geomorphic methods which measure the cumulative results of complex interrelated physical, chemical, and biologic processes on the landscape, and correlation methods, which establish age equivalence using time-independent properties. The second classification of quaternal geochronologic methods are based on the type of the results. So, we have the numerical age methods, which are those that produce results on a ratio or an absolute scale. We have the calibrated age method, which can provide approximated numerical ages. We have the relative age methods, which can provide an age sequence and most uh, provide some measures of the magnitude of age differences between members of a sequence and the correlated age methods, which do not directly measure, measure ages, but they produce ages only by demonstrating equivalence to independently 
embedded deposits on banks. This is uh, a table where we can see the two classification methods by the type of results and by the type of methods. You can see that the type of results are bigger groups that they include several types of methods. For example, the numerical age uh, includes the side real uh, method, the isotopic method, and the, the biogenic methods. Also, the calibrated age or relative age methods include chemical, geomorphic, and other methods. So, let's continue with the first method that we will discuss. It's a side real method and called dendrochronology. Dendrochronology is a dating method which is based on variations in annual growth rings of trees. Tree growth responds to climatic variations throughout the region and allows crops dating of the rings between the trees. Ring growth responds to physical disturbance or changing environments and allows the dating of positive geological events. Let's see a little bit about the theory of the method. So the metrochronology is based on the strong tendency of trees in, in temperate boreal regions to grow one growth in three psyllium cells per year on the outer portion of the wooden stem, just beneath the bark. The demarcation between rings is identifiable in most conifer. In broadleaf trees and geosperms, most ring core species have well-defined ring with vessels of pods concentrated at the beginning of each leaf. Ring boundaries in the fused pores and whisper have less clear definition and are more difficult to see. In many species, there can be false and missing things due to unusual growth, conditions, or trauma. So in the picture above, we can see the, the most recent, recent year of growth. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yes. OK. So this is the outer ring, the most recent year of growth. And as long as we go in the center of the we can see several different rings. Each ring responds to one year of growth of the tree. So as long as we go inside, we can start to count how many years uh, we have from the beginning of the life of the tree. So the node datum is the outer ring and the season of sampling. Cross dating or overlapping synchronizes the ring with factor back in time to this exact calendar, calendar of ring formation. A correctly dated time series of ring widths, it's called the chronology. Three certain and uh, ring characteristics, such as width, responds to a greater or lesser rate of climatic variation. At extreme growth location, where the growth is strongly limited by some climatic factors, such as temperature or moisture, things with will vary greatly and the tree or site is term sensitive. In the growth site, in less ex if the growth site is less extreme, with a more bending temperature or suitable moist, the climatic induced ring with variations are reduced. The trees on the side are term complete. Side differences play an important role in tree response. Within one climatic region, they can be wet, intermediate, and dry sites, or low elevation of higher elevation sites that will change the influence of climate on tree. Younger trees can be more resistant to the factors influencing 
trading growth. So if we have a tree in uh, an extreme growth location, we will have variations in the width of the, uh, of the tree rings. Uh, and, the, and the site uh, and the tree is called sensitive. In those sites, we can identify some geological events uh, to the, which are uh, related to climatic factors, which are detected in, to the width the trees. In other sites that are less extreme, the moisture and the temperature are suitable, we do not have identify any difference between the properties during the year. There are some factors influencing the tree growth. Those are the closing of captive forest, so we do not have the sun passing through the trees, so we do not have the proper growth of the, of the tree. The loss of the nearby territory fires and human intervention. In order to show that certain trees were affected by unequal non climatic turbans, their growth rates must be compared to normal So the comparison or control trees are sample to develop the chronology of disturbed growth. So we compare our samples or samples and we can identify the difference between the second year uh, of uh, rings and we can identify which geological event or enter climatic or not climatic disturbance has occurred good that year. The longevity of trees is a major factor in establishing the useful time range uh, geochronology. We have several species throughout the world that we may come up to 1,000 years or more. The species of trees in the 300 to 400 year longevity range have greater potential geochronology because they are widely distributed and therefore are likely to be found so grown into site of interest. Cross dating over overlapping can also be used to extend just beyond the age of living trees, up to 10,000 years. On the top of the picture, we can see an example of overlapping uh, technique. We have a tree from the 1999, the upper, uh, the upper tree, uh, in which we can see uh, that at the last tree, it's a solar pattern with another tree which is later, and so on, and the tree is overlapping with tree. So we can continue to date up to 10,000 years. Let's see about the sampling methods. Living trees can be sampled, non destructive by taking increment cores from them. The Swedish increment border removes the thin approximately 5 millimeter diameter core sample, as you can see in the photo uh, right next to the text. The core is reduced transecting all the annual rings from the bark to the near uh, of the center of the tree. After something, trees continue growing and they are available for future sampling if it's necessary. So it is a non-destructive technique. If we have dead trees to us and the roots, we can sample by cutting section of them by hands or chains. The section should be big enough to remain intact for sanding and measurement of the that material can also be cold if it's necessary, but can be taken to keep the most fragile cores in place. The larger border that extracts a 5 mm diameter core is sometimes very helpful. Let's go to see how we can do <coughs> the laptop analysis. 
the course in the section are some of the in traverse section until the individual is visible. Is visible. Scales has been developed in the direction for the best definition of Rings width are measured to the resolution of machines and the data of inappropriate uh, media. The actual data of the rings can be done or not uh, using skeleton plots and other matching techniques. The skeleton plots that have not really made from, for, from some specific areas, so we cannot uh, sample of the of the tree uh, with other diagrams of the specific area and use it to identify the, the time the age that we want to determine. So the scale of the plot is a graphical representation of the ring with variation. If they are you're missing off the ring, the data can be expedited by statistical processing. Uh, computer processing and statistical correlation can generally increase the efficiency of the analysis. The data analysis, the time series of ring with data, can be reviewed for data and determine accuracy by programs such as COVEC. Uh, the raw data from one side, a set of samples, can be reduced to a single time series mm -hmm. uh, which is called chronology for data set. This is the that you can see at the bottom of the page. You can see the three ring widths in millimeter in the y axis and in the x axis you can see the years. In addition to numerical analysis and dating the ring anatomy, it's important in the analysis. So, the dental chronology is a very easy method to use. It's a non destructive method and it's uh, quite cheap to perform. We only need a border in order to take uh, a sample from the tree. Also, it is very important that the tree can continue uh, to grow and can take samples. Uh, as many times as we uh, want uh, in the future for calibrating our results. Uh, the, 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 the dental chronology, it is quite important in order to understand and identify several events that happen to the area of our interest. Uh, this kind of uh, events can be depicted in the week of the of the reef. And uh, if we are able to know the age, the date of the ring, we can identify also the date and the age of the of the event that uh, it is depicted there. It is very efficient in order to identify uh, seismic events in uh, in several areas and to find out the time that the, uh, the event was happening. So that was the first thought. Do we have any questions about the dendrochronology or we can continue to the next method? Do you guys have any questions? No? With the other man. Okay, so we can continue. Okay. Uh, yeah. What I want to ask is, from what I understood, the trees, in order to be chronologized, this method must be alive, must be found alive. Can you please ask again, because I cannot hear you very well. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, the trees, in order to be dated with this method, they have to be uh, alive. Or it can be applied in a no. day? No. Okay. Uh, if they are alive, okay, uh, we can uh, take uh, a sample and the tree will continue to, to grow. And we can overlap the, the result, the, 
the call of the trees uh, with other calls from dead or alive trees. If the trees are dead, then uh, we can use them only for correlation because we do not know when, when they, they were dead. dead. Okay. okay, so we have to take uh, a sample from a control tree and try to identify the same width, the same pattern of, uh, of tree rings to the control tree and uh, overlap it with the, with the dead tree. And there are no ways of uh, determining when a dead tree died? Uh, no, we cannot identify that. Okay, thank you. The, the easiest is to find an alive tree because we know that the outer uh, ring is uh, dated today. So we can uh, we know that uh, we can start to measure the rings from uh, this uh, season back to time, okay, and then we can correlate it with other trees in the site. But the correlation must be between uh, trees of the same species, or is there some limitation in what kinds we can be used for, for the correlation? Yes, it's, it is better to use trees from the same species, because uh, different species can grow differently, and uh, uh, we might have some uh, rings missing, so it is it is better to, to find uh, uh, spe uh, trees from the same species. Okay. But it can, if we don't uh, find, I don't know, it can be used, um, different species to correlate, can it be used or it's, uh, it doesn't happen, it's of no point in doing this, something like this? Uh, if you do not have any other data that you can receive from the area, maybe you can try to correlate uh, uh, trainings from uh, different species. Uh, but you have to be considered that uh, uh, you have to understand the physiology of the tree and how the tree grows. So you have to cooperate with uh, the biologist in order to understand exactly how the tree grows and in order to be able to correlate it with other species. Okay, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other question? There's uh, also one more question. If uh, burned trees can be used? Of course we can use burned trees. Uh, also we can identify uh, when a fire was uh, in the area by the, the burned trees. So if the tree is not completely burned, it will continue to grow. So in between the growth uh, rings, uh, we can find uh, one ring that it will be black, so we can identify the time of the, of the fire. If the, if the tree is dead after the fire, uh, we can take a sample and see if the core will be readable uh, and if it's not completely destroyed by the fire. Okay, thank you. We can go on to the next method. Okay, let's go to the next method. The second method is also side of foot and foot part of this. Parts are laminated sediments that record annual seasonal cycles in lakes. Several different types of processes can lead to the formation of parts. In principle, the thickness variations in any well dated sequence of parts can be used to provide edge control for the basin within which the barbs 
were the coincidence. Most types of parts are, are less than a millimeter thick, and it is often impractical to determine the thickness of each individual part. Glacial parts are one exception to this rule. The glacial parts are seed clay outlets that form in eggs, which are fed by the runoff of one or more glaciers. Barbs are produced by the plum of sediment carried into the lake by glacial meltwater in the spring and in the, and in the summer. The coarser material of this plum settles, settles out rapidly to form the first component of the glacial bar, which is the silt layer. The final material remains in suspension much longer, perhaps even until the lake freezes again in winter. When the finer material does settle, it forms the second glacial part, which is the clay layer. Each silt and clay couplet represents one third of the position. This is uh, a picture of creation of the silt can see the glacier here, the run of water, the melted water going to the lake. Uh, in the summer, the coarser uh, material forms the first layer, which is the silt layer. And the finer material in the winter settles down and creates the second layer. As we said before, it's each couplet of these silt and clay layers. It's, 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 it's one year of the position of the lake. So the basic attraction of bar basin is that within a given basin, the sequence of bar that at any site in this basin during given time interval will have the same pattern of thickness variation as any other site. So determining the age an undated site is accomplished by matching the pattern of thicknesses for the undated sequence with established pattern of knowledge. This is uh, very close to the theory we saw before. So we have uh, the silt and clay couplets. They have certain uh, width, certain thickness, and uh, we can identify a pattern in, the, in an outcrop in the lake, and we can correlate it, uh, correlate it with, another, uh, with another pattern that is not really related, and have uh, a, a new date for a specific site. Uh, the bar dating can only be done in a geological setting that has resulted in the deposition of bars. The methods also require the prior existence of well-dated bulb chronology. Although there is no reason why glacial bulbs dating not be used with glacial deposits of any age, most known glacial bulb sequence were deposited since the last glacial maximum. The sampling methods. Uh, the most common technique for obtaining information for uh, glacial bulbs is to lay a strip of tape against the clean vertical face of the outcrop and to mark the position of each valve boundary to the paper. As material should be removed from the face of the outcrop to expose less sample moist material. If the glacial bars are very moist, they can be collected as slabs or blocks and allowed to dry the until the boundaries become apart. It is also possible to collect cores of part sediments. This is how our areas are seen in the, uh, in the field. Uh, in most cases, all the necessary data are collected in the field. So the only laboratory is uh, the creation of the so thicknesses versus the part here like the one we saw before in the, the chronology date. 
Uh, if the variants are far present, as shown in the case for non capital part, it is possible to use uh, photography or radiography and for settings to estimate how many bars there are to make their individual thicknesses. Data analysis consists of finding a good match between the undated bar thickness and a portion of the known bar chronology. The main advantage of using bar chronologies is that they have potential to provide dating with a resolution of one year. The main disadvantages of the method is that it can only be used in geological setting associated with the position of bars. The individual bars must be thick enough that part by part measurements can be made. The bar chronology is a little bit limited to, to glacial bars. Uh, this is uh, because we have a lot of sediments in the run of the waters of the, the glaciers. But the last years, uh, we have achieved to identify bars also that larger basins in uh, larger uh, lakes uh, and even in, in oceans. But it's uh, quite difficult to identify because of the thickness of the bars. They are very, very small. They are less than a millimeter. And you have to, we have to be very careful in order to, to identify the, the cow plates and to identify the years that uh, we want to see the, the events, the disturbance, or the events that have occurred and they have uh, changed the, the thickness of the, of the bars. The, the bar chronology is important because it is directly correlated to the variation of the, of the climate. So when we have a high temperature, the, the melting water will be uh, high, at the same time, the sea, the clay, lake will be thicker. In the times of uh, uh, low temperature, the water will be uh, less. The sea can take out to be thinner. A very good indicator of uh, the thickness of the layers in order to understand the eclectic conditions in that specific year when the disturbance is occurred. So that was the bar canon. Do we have questions about the bar? has 
프리의 마츠라이어 터미널에서 도착했어. 카본 프레, 카본 프레틴, 앤 카본 프레틴. 아주 강세의 카본 프레틴, 이스 좀 less quantity yoga tour. 카본 프레틴, it is present now because this concept is produced. It's with nitrogen and oxygen atoms in their product. The chemical equation described in the creation and the decay of carbon-14 are the following where the uh, nitrogen interacts with uh, a neutron due to cosmic rays and produce a carbon-14 uh, atom and, uh, prom and uh, proton. Uh, the carbon-14 decays uh, because it is unstable to nitrogen-14 and emitting an electron and uh, an electron uh, neutrino. And the global production rate of carbon-14 is approximately two atoms uh, per square centimeter per second. The carbon-14 atom, after it produced, oxidized to uh, carbon oxide which has an atmospheric light and observed one before it uh, further has to, to, to cut dioxide. The lunar atmospheric lifetime of carbon dioxide enables the carbon dioxide with carbon-14 to become well mixed throughout the troposphere. The steady state of carbon-14 content of the atmosphere is determined by the exchange of carbon in uh, carbon dioxide that in ocean and biospheric reservoir. The relatively rapid cycling of carbon allows plants to maintain carbon-14 activity, which is approximately equal to that of the atmosphere. The tissues of plants, which consume plants, will similarly uh, reflect the carbon-14 activity of the plants. As we can see on the picture right next to the text, we have the creation of 14, which is uh, participating in the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide uh, uh, atmospheric mixing, and through photosynthesis, goes to the tissues of the plants, in which uh, the animals will uh, consume, and in that way, the plants and the animals will continue to replenish the carbon-14 content of their organisms until they become dead. And uh, the carbon-14 in their tissues will start to decay. To decay. So upon the death of, a, of a, an organism, the carbon-14 in its tissues is no, is, uh, no longer uh, replenished through direct or indirect exchange with atmospheric CO2 and undergoes a reactive decay back to nitrogen-14. If the tissue remains uh, intact and isolated from exchange, the free carbon-14 content and start the living organism may be used to indicate the time since it left the orbit. In the plot, we can see a living organism that has 100% carbon-14 in, uh, in the tissue. After the death of the organism, uh, the, the carbon-14 will start, will start to decay and uh, in 5,700 years, which is the half life of carbon-14, we will have the half on the, that we had in the beginning, 50%. This will go on at approximately 28,500,000 years, when the content of the carbon-14 will be very, very small. Uh, inside the, the tissues of the, 
uh, of the of the animal or the plants. The calculation of a radiocarbonate requires the assumption that the carbon-14 content of the carbon originally fixed in plant or animal tissues equals that of the atmosphere CO2 during the critical real times. There are three major problems with this assumption. The first problem is that the chemical and biological reaction uh, fractionate isotopes according to their mass. So, the carbon 14, carbon 12 ratio in atmospheric CO2 will differ uh, from organic carbon fixed from the atmosphere by photosynthesis because the carbon atom is heavier than the carbon 12 uh, atom. This is uh, easily corrected by measuring the degree to which mass dependent fractionation affects the state of carbon 13 isotope content of a sample and assume that the fraction of carbon 13 will be a double that of the carbon 13. So this is a mathematical problem and it is uh, very easy to solve with, uh, with some equations. The second problem is that the carbon-14 content of the atmosphere has varied time, both because of changes in the production rate of the carbon-14, due to cost rays, uh, flux, and magnetic field variations, and because of changes in the distribution of the carbon among the biosphere and the atmospheric temperatures. <laughs> These variations, we choose from the carbon-14 content of known age, taken from the growth elements of trees, are generally less than 10 percent over, over the past 7,000 years, but may approach 30 percent uh, percent for samples greater than 13,000 years. And the correction factor factors to detect calendar uh, ages for, for conventional carbon-14 measures are based on the observed carbon-14 of independently dated clearing cellulose, macrofossils from particle experiments, and coral tablets. In the plot right next to the text, you can see a comparison between the carbon-14 age and the thorium uranium age, in which you can see uh, at, uh, at the same samples. Uh, you can see that uh, up to 7,000 years, we didn't have any difference between the two dates. But after 30,000 years, we can see that the ages that we have obtained from carbon-14, it's uh, much deeper than the ones that we have uh, take from the thorium uranium age. The third problem is that radiocarbon date arises from the re-evaluation of the half-life of carbon-14 after several body of research, which have been already published. The convention, uh, which has been established, is to use the older the half-life of radiocarbon, which is 5,568 years, for calculation and reporting of prevention of radiocarbon ages. Calibrated ages, although it have the existing trading records to determine the carbon years associated with the radiocarbon age. So, Libby produced the radiocarbon age that it was 5,568 years, and a lot of literature was uh, uh, using this uh, half life of radiocarbon to determine the age. Uh, after using existing trading records, uh, uh, we determined that the half-life of radiocarbon is 5,730 uh, 5, years. So we have a difference between the first half-life by PD and the second half-life, uh, which is correlated with trading records. 
So the one, the first one, the Libby half-time age, it's the conventional, we call them conventional ages of radiocarbon, calibrated ages, we use the correct uh, half-life of carbon for our uh, analysis of uh, radiocarbon age. Let's see the time range and consider the TV of the radiocarbon method. Radiocarbon dating is applicable to a from, from photosynthetically fixed carbon. The usefulness of radiocarbon dating method is limited by several factors. We have variations of carbon 14 in atmospheric CO2 in the past. The overall accuracy of the radiocarbon analysis including back background contamination, proper selection of samples. Is. The applicable range is generally more than 100 years and less than 55,000 years. The younger time range limits stems from increasing the carbon 14 context of the atmosphere reported in moon age clearings. The older we are, the older the time. Limit is primarily due to problems associated with contamination of samples, tiny amounts of modern carbon, either due to sample processing or due to contamination in the soil or sediment tricks, or due to carbon 14 produced in situ in the sample by cosmic rays so far. So, a sample to be suitable for radiocarbon dating must contain carbon originally from a pet field and must have a clear relationship in its geologic context to the event to be dated. Sample of materials commonly measured are wood seeds, pollen, charcoal, bones, uh, peat, heating, or carbonate. Great care should be taken in describing and labeling the material according to its location and output. The samples should be stored in containers, which will prevent contamination, such as aluminum oil, curves, bottles, pocket and bottles or bags. Samples should be accurately labeled with location, date, type of material, and other the information. There are two different methods presently in use for measuring the radiocarbon content of organic matter. The first is the carbon-14 activity of the sample by counting using gas professional counting of CO2, of methane, of acetylene, of ethane, uh, or by liquid scintillation coupling of benzene. The second method is accelerated mass spectrometry, which uses the particle accelerator to achieve energies high enough to measure individual ion carbon. This is uh, also uh, this used uh, because, uh, as we talked before, carbon-14 uh, atom is heavier than the other uh, two isotopes, the carbon-12 and the carbon-13. So it works if we accelerate uh, this atom because it's scalar, it will deflect more from the other, so we can count the uh, atom by atom of carbon-14. The accuracy and the precision of both Okay, counting and AMS measurements are similar. The procedure for sample free treatment and measurements vary greatly depending on the amount of type of that could be measured and of, of uh, the method for measuring the carbon 14. Cleaning and chemical preparation procedure are similar for both acceleration mass spectrometry and decay count. The goal of the treatment is to ensure the material to be dated 
is free from contaminating carbon of different age. Some procedures, such as those extracting samples from wood, collagen for Focus on isolation and original organic constituents, which has not been raised yet, and which is unlikely to have been added to the fossil after the fossilization. Other procedures involving washing some in acids and bases, better again at the cleaning artificial carbonates and protein organics. This is a table that will give some precise or AMS and DK counting analysis of different types of samples. Uh, the difference between the two methods, uh, as you can see, is that the sample size for uh, AMS is much lesser than the sample size for uh, decay counting. So, for example, if we need to date wood, we would only need uh, 2 to 5 milligrams for uh, acceleration mass spectrometry uh, technique, but we need 10 to 25 grams. So, <coughs> more uh, sample. Uh, sample size for uh, EK count. And uh, in the last uh, um, column, we can see uh, some notes of the pretreatment, what we do in each, uh, in each uh, material. We immediately have to extract the cellulose, also in the leaves, in bone, the most uh, mostly the treatment, uh, the line of non the extraction, extraction of intact proteins, and so on. So, in uh, every different material, we use a very different technique for pre-treatment the samples. Uh, but overall, we need the the carbon uh, that the, the organic cut that it is uh, inside the, the, the inside the material that we want to use. Uh, the radiocarbon method, as we told before, is uh, most widely used uh, today in uh, in geology, geo from in geology, geology, and archaeology. Uh, it is a quite fast technique. It is not so expensive technique. Uh, so we can do multiple samples uh, uh, each time. Uh, you can find some laboratories to do AMS analysis for uh, 150 euros. And you can find also uh, laboratories that can do AMS with 300 or 350 euros per sample. So it is quite important nowadays because of the um, uh, of the lower funding that we have uh, during our research. Uh, it is quite good that we have a relatively cheap method that it is uh, it, it is very applicable to our geological problems. So that was the. Do you have any questions about this method? No questions? Yes. Are you there? Okay. My question is uh, related to fractionation of isotopes of carbon. Because yes. I, I, yeah, uh, does it have any effect in the um, rate of decay of carbon fourteen and in the in our dating uh, procedures? The fractionation between the isotopes of the of the carbon. You Be mean uh, yes, the because it, the when when the organism the carbon fourteen. Yes. Yes, when the organism during the lifetime when it was alive, it goes uh, a lot of, uh, there are fractionation processes uh, between the 13 and 14, uh, 12. So does this affect in the process? 
or when it died? Does it have any effect? Okay, so yes, uh, there are vaccinations, there are also the chain of uh, carbon uh, 14 during the lifetime of an organism. But uh, as long as the organism continues to feed, it uh, continues to, to replenish the quantity of, uh, of carbon-14 and also the carbon-12 and carbon-13 uh, quantities inside, the, the, inside the, the tissue, inside the organism. As soon as the, the organism dies, uh, the fractionation between the, the isotope will start to begin. And it will be different between the different isotopes. Uh, for example, the carbon for uh, the carbon 13 is more stable than the carbon 14, and the half life is uh, much much bigger. Uh, it is uh, or uh, it is uh, better for us to use the carbon 14 because of the short half life. That, uh, that we have. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's all I have. And the second one is uh, the difference between the counting, the measure, the, me the procedures, uh, the methods. There's mm -hmm. one in counting and the other one, uh, the accelerated yes. mass spectrometry. Yes. Despite these uh, differences in sample size, uh, is there any other advantage or disadvantage or big difference between these? And uh, no, no, uh, they are equal accurate methods. The the only differences we have it's the smaller sample size and the shorter time we need with the acceleration mass spectrometry in order to do uh, more samples. So. In acceleration mass uh, spectrometry, we can uh, proceed up to 100 samples per day. Uh, and on the counting, uh, in the decay counting method, uh, we can proceed five samples per day. Uh, so this is translated of, uh, you know, um, for saving time and of course saving funds. But other than that, we do not have any other differences between the two methods. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Do we have any other question? Any other question? No. We gathered from the number of us in pieces. But ask me if you I cannot see you and I'm not sure if you are falling asleep. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's too much. The, the physics and the chemistry at uh, 12 uh, in the morning, it's, it's too much. I can't understand that. So let's continue with another isotopic method, which is the uranium series dating. The known decay rate of natural uranium into a series of dotted isotopes provides a radiometric clock that's had, that has been crucial for defining quaternary timescales. In principle, any material that contains a sufficient amount of uranium that it's not in a radioactive equilibrium with its doctor, it's suitable for them. There are three uranium series decay chains that start with a naturally occurring radioactive isotope, uranium-238, uranium-235, and thorium-232. And then with a stable isotope of lead, lead-206, lead-207, and lead-208 respect. The most widely used new series isotopes for pattern validation are the first two products, and the uranium-238 decay change, which is the uranium-234 and the thorium-230. Both uranium-238 and uranium-235 are not with isotopes with half-lives of 
for four seven and uh, zero point seven giga years respectively. While the half lives of the immediate daughter are much shorter, two hundred and forty five kilo annums or uh, uranium two thirty four. 76,000 years for them to 30 and 36, uh, uh, 33,000 years for uh, productinium 231. Over quarter the time scales, the change in parts of the thing or number of decays per unit time will be negligible and the activity of the dot isotope will change until the number of parts applied by the decay of the parent equals the number of atoms removed by the decay of the picture. This condition is not the active or secular equity, and it is characterized by equal activities of parent and daughter or a parent-daughter activity ratio of one. This is the uranium 230 decay change. You can see only the main decays. Uh, the gamma emitters are not equated in, uh, in this chart. You can see on the far right the uranium 238 will start to decay, emitting the alpha radiation to thorium 234, which decay to productinium 234, and this will continue. Uh, until we are, uh, uh, until we reach the lead 206, which is the, in this chain we can use any of the members uh, in order to identify how many cases each of the member has uh, uh, have been done uh, in uh, in a ratio with the uh, start. With the uh, 238, which is the parent uh, isotope. So we have the parent isotope, which is decaying. We have daughter isotope, which is also decaying. If the two are not in equilibrium, uh, which means they are not decaying the same, they are not emitting the same amount of, uh, of ions, uh, then we can update them. If they are an equilibrium, then they are not suitable for dating. A new serial system in a radioactive equilibrium cannot be used as a chronometer. The dating requires an, an initial state of this equilibrium. Uranium is commonly fractionated from its immediate daughters in natural waters to to the contrasting geochemical properties. In the presence of oxygen, of oxygen, the solubility of uranium in natural water is fairly high, while the solubility of thorium and productinium are quite good. So this is a very good uh, occasion to use it as a chronometer. The biotic and the biogenic carbonates precipitated from natural waters frequently contain significant uranium and eligible sodium and protein concentration, which are ideal situation for new series dating. The dating of porous since the times has been quite important for establishing chronologies as well as for reconstructing sea level in climate change histories and the dating of this material provides an instructive illustration of uranium series of chronology. Methodology. We continue with the methodology. The carbonate deposits are the most common material for lucid dating. Uncrystallized coral and cured spheroidine samples are ideal. Calcite, gypsum, opaline deposits, fracture open, or as vein fillings are often fair cure material used for dating. In the absence of these clean phases, impure carbonates 
may provide a reliable latent information using the eyes of chromium. Sample size depends on the uranium concentration of the material to be dated. Typically, uranium concentration of impure calcite are uh, 0.2 to 2 dpm per gram. dpm is decent disintegration per minute. Two disincretation per minute per gram. The alpha spectrometric analysis requires about 1 dpm as a minimum. The isochron dating requires a minimum of 30 subsamples, which are at least 10 to 20 grams of radio car of uh, carbonates in the fields. The thermal ionization mass spectrometric, the TIMS analysis, requires 10 times less sample material than the alpha spectrometric analysis, which is about 1 to 2 grams. Uh, clean containers must be uh, made of papers, plastic, or clothes, are all acceptable in transported samples from brand serious dating. In uranium serious dating, the upper age limits are approximately uh, 150,000 years for actinium and uranium, 350,000 years for thorium and uranium, and uran 234 uranium 238, and 300,000 years for actinium and thorium. The thermal ionization mass spectrometric analysis of these isotopes improves the measurement error to less than 1% and extends the dating range to 600,000 uh, years with uh, thorium run and run run methods. At the lower end of the age range, the limit is determined by our, by our ability to extract the astrogenic phase of uh, analysis, as well as by the analytical precision. For pure astrogenic deposits, such as borderline material, conventional AES measures should be able to date ages up to 1,000 years. With thin measurements, the low bound ages could be as low as less than 100 years. For young corals, uh, this technique is preferable to carbon-14 dating because of the uncertainties in the input uh, function of carbon-14. So the original uh, serious dating. It is uh, quite hard to understand and to to applicate to samples technique. Uh, but it is a quite accurate technique. And uh, on the uh, right samples, we can use it and we prefer to use it uh, from the carbon 14 dating uh, because we have some certainties regarding the problems, the theoretical problems of the third photo of 14. It is a quite expensive, it is quite expensive uh, method, so we have to be very careful in order to take the correct samples for the methods to be, for the method to be applied. Um, uh, mostly we need uh, clean phases, aftergenic phases and cleaning phases of carbonates in order to to date the the materials, the samples. So that was the uranium dating technique. Uh, do we have any questions about the uh, the uranium series? to the next method. Do you guys get a small break? Yes. yes. But it will be just five minutes. Okay. Μητιάδη. Μητιάδη. Τους κάνουμε ένα μικρό διάλειμμα, ένα πεντάλεπτο, για να έρθουν στα ίσα τους. Ναι, όσο Γιατί μάλλον σε ρί δεν νομίζω θα τη βγάλουνε. Και όχι τίποτα, αλλά άμα σε χάσουνε μετά δεν έχει νέα να, να μην έχουν ακούνε τι σου λες. Κοίταξε, έχει μείνει μόνο η, η OSL και η 
ξέρουν αυτά τα βιβλία. Επειδή δεν θέλουν να τα ακούσουν, ίσω αν του κάτσει ένα πεντάλεπτο θα του μαζέψω. Οκ, okay, ωραία. Να πάρουν Πάμε ένα. ένα Μπράβο, κάνει ένα τσιγάρο, θα κάνουν και εγώ ένα τσιγάρο και σε... <laughs> <laughs> τα λέμε σε, σε πέντε λεπτάκια. Εντάξει. Σε κλείνω προ το παρόν, έτσι. Ναι. Έγινε, έγινε. Τα λέμε σε λίγο, έλα, για. Just five minutes, guys, don't be late.
Δεν με βλέπει. Μιλτιάδη, χαίρετε. Χαίρετε, χαίρετε. Του έχουμε όλου πίσω, οπότε νομίζω ότι μπορούμε να ξεκινήσουμε. Ωραία, τώρα να βάλουμε αυτή. Βλέπετε την οθόνη μου. Ναι, ναι. Όσο πιο δυνατά μπορείς μόνο, γιατί έχουμε και θορύβους απ' έξω και μερικές φορές ε, χάνεσαι. Ωραία. Okay. So, we are ready to continue with uh, the next and last uh, method, which is a radiogenic method, OSL PL. OSL stands for optical stimulated luminescence and TL for thermal luminescence. So we have significant innovations during the past few decades in dosimetry based techniques such as thermal luminescence and optical stimulated luminescence provides uh, improved capabilities for dating quaternary sediments. Luminescent geochronology is an important tool in deciphering geologic records because it is one of the few techniques that can be applied in a variety of terrestrial stratigraphic settings. In the picture, you can see a RISO thermoluminescence OSL reader, which is the model DA20. Uh, this is uh, an equipment that we can measure the luminescence. The most common silicate minerals, which are the quartz and the feldspars, contain lattice effects formed during crystallizations or from exposure to nuclear radiations. The effects are potential sites of electron storage and a subsequent source for the luminescent signal. The luminescent signal is acquired by exposure to ionizing radiation 
mostly from radioactive decay of uranium thorium and a radioactive isotope of potassium 40. The release of beta and gamma particles from the decay of potassium 40 and mostly alpha particles from uranium and thorium decay series within minerals displaces lattice bound electrons, which are subsequently stored within lattice defects called electron traps. A population of these electrons are stored in deep traps that are theoretically stable for more than one million years, providing a geochronologically significant luminescence signal. This is the luminescence energy diagram. So we have the valence uh, band and the conduction band. We are talking about the uh, in atomic uh, uh, size. Uh, when we, ha we have the in silicate minerals, we have radiation interacts with the crystal, which is the first phase, the phase of irradiation. The energy pushes an electron into the conduction band and leaves a hole in the valence band. The electron may become trapped at defect sites, like the T1 or the T2, that you can see in the irradiation phase, here and here, for some time. When the crystal is stimulated by light or heat, the electron in the traps are evicted to the contaction band, which is the eviction phase here. So we have the heat, and the electrons uh, evicted from the traps goes back to the contaction band, and then back to the pallet uh, band, and they reconnect with the and a big a photon, a light. So they recombine with holes at the luminescent centers, resulting in the emission of a photon. The luminescent signal is that uh, we observed in the laboratory. The luminescent signal increases with time, reflecting a longer exposure to environmental radiation. Heating of sediments causes vibration of the mineral lattice and eviction of time-stored electrons from traps. Some of these electrons may reach luminescent center and result in the emission of light. The luminescent signal is proportional to total exposure to environmental radiation, which is a fraction of time. Sediment rates act as a long-term radiation dosimeters with the luminescent signal uh, a measure of radiation exposure during the burial period. So in other words, and more simple, uh, when we have uh, a grain of quartz of spark, it develops a luminescent signal with the ways that we have before. When it grains is exposed to light, the luminescent signal goes to zero, which is called leaching. When the grass is deposited and buried, it starts to create a signal again from the beginning. When we take this grain from a sediment and we take it to the laboratory and measure the radiation that is inside the grain, we can uh, estimate, we can see how much radiation has absorbed during from the deposition to the laboratory, which means the, during the deposition of, uh, of burial. The sediment, uh, the radiation, which is responsible for using the luminescent signal and determining this value solves the half of the luminescence edge equation. 
the luminescent age equation, it's quite simple. Uh, the age equals the, uh, the, me the measurement of the application that we found in the laboratory divided by the angular radiation that the sample was uh, exposed to. So if we count the laboratory 100 grays of, uh, of equivalent dose, and uh, we go up to it, and we measure 10 of annual radiation, that means the age of the, of the sample will be 10 years. It is uh, a quite uh, easy uh, equation to understand. The other half of the equation is the dose rate, which is an estimate of the environmental radioactivity of the sediment for the time period. Differences between the OSL and TL. OSL and TL are based both on the same phenomenon of luminescence. The OSL measures a time stored luminescent signal by exposure to light, whereas the thermal luminescent is measured by heating the sample to approximately 450 uh, degrees Celsius. The thermal luminescence analysis releases photons within a mineral that varied from both light sensitive and sensitive electron traps. OSL heating often uses light of particular wavelength, uh, releasing rapidly theory, only the light sensitive electrons from crystal lattices. So the thermal luminescence releases photons both from light sensitive and sensitive electron traps. An OSL that releases uh, electrons on, on light sensitive electron traps. Increasing the OSL signal after 20 second exposure to sunlight is equivalent to the reduction of the thermal essence signal after a 20 hour light exposure. So, when to deal with OSL samples, you have to be very careful uh, not to expose them to sunlight because the OSL uh, signal will be reduced significantly uh, only 20 seconds. And the OSL measures <coughs> funds that accumulate from light sensitive traps, leaving behind the light intensive traps. There are many different types of segments that can be or have the potential to be created by luminescence. We told before that uh, uh, every segment that contain uh, quartz or feldspar uh, have the potential to be created by luminescence uh, methods. The selection and the sampling of segments in the first is uh, the first crucial steps in the luminescence analysis. A luminescence age is a measure of time since the last sun exposure or heating event of the bedroom. We explained that before that is the time of the burial of the sediment. So the preferred sediments for luminescence dating are prolonged at follow to stimulate prior to deposition, accumulated as a relatively homogeneous stratigraphic unit and has not significant water content variation or the agent changes during the barrier. We want our sample to be exposed to sunlight because the prior to deposition, because we want the uh, nascent signal to be zero before the burial of the of the sediment. We want to be homogeneous stratigraphic unit. Uh, because not want to have uh, grains of the crystals of quartz and first parts from different places, so uh, it, it will be difficult to distinguish uh, the origin of these crystals. And regarding the origin, it's, it is also the, we can estimate the the annual dose 
not they have received. And uh, it's significant uh, to have water content uh, because uh, uranium is uh, easier to to find in in, uh, in humid in water in moist conditions. So we will have a greater uh, annual dose in those samples. So in many sedimentary settings, the fine grain for uh, the fine grain polymineral fraction is preferred for the sediments that is rapidly deposited and exceeds little less than one hour or no lighter for the floor is preferred in a for for luminescent age. So T is the brief open air flows uh, grain colluvium and some of the type yellow glacial and some marine and lack stream uh, sediments which receive insufficient satellite exposure before uh, the period of the before the deposition of the of the sediment if it's not uh, so good for dating. Temporal limitation of luminescent technique is difficult to assess because of the many different factors of their precision and the retention of the luminescent signal. In general, the luminescent techniques are most useful for set span span past uh, 100,000 years. May be applicable in certain situations for approximately 500,000 years or more. Recently, we have some data that show uh, that nascent dating on its parts can go back to approximately one million years. The precision of the technique is usually between 5 20 percent, with maximum resolution in time scales of uh, 1,000 to 1 million years, to 100,000 to 1 million years. Low environment those rates, it is important for extending the longevity of the luminescent methods. Those rates can be the level of natural variation that includes a change factor, which eventually measures in the laboratory essence. So if we have the exact same uh, grain of parts in two different environments, in the first environment, if we have a low dose rate, the traps will build in much longer time than if we have the same crystal, another mark, high uh, animal dose, which in uh, the traps will build in a much shorter time uh, so the lower the radiation, the slower the displaced electron, and the uh, slower the result of the essence level. It is important to understand that we do not have infinity uh, traps uh, of electrons in the lattice of, uh, of crystal. So if we have higher radiation, annual radiation in an area, it fill up much faster uh, than uh, if we have lower radiation in, uh, in another area. Let's proceed with the sampling methods. We need at least 30 centimeters of homogeneous sediments surrounding the collected strata. We need approximately 30 grams of sediment to, co to be collected. Care must be taken not to expose the sediment to light during sampling. Prior to sampling, the section should be excavated back at least 20 meters to expose fresh space. Light and water tight container are used in samplings in order to identify the moisture level of the sediment and because we do not want the sunlight to, to go through the sediment. And it is recommended that uh, an additional uh, 500 to 800 grams of sample be taken from the 
same layer for those rates. Finally, logic and geometric analysis. Without further measurements of MSN signals requires the detection of released photons, amplification, experiments of the positive signals. Photon appears with heating or lighting of sediments are detected by a photoelectric material, a photocathode, within a photomatrix tube, which results in a proportional emission of electrons. Pulses of electrons are amplified and uh, then scales up 30 photons per second as a function of keeping temperature or the sample. So we have the sample at the picture here. We have the incident photon beam and the emitted photon that uh, will go to photoelectric material and they will multiply uh, in order to count them to our uh, to our interface. This is uh, the basic feature of the TL OSL reader that can be used to measure luminescence signal using either heat or optical stimulations. If you can first here we can we have the samples. We can uh, <coughs> stimulate the samples by light or heat. The photon will be released and we will go to the photomultiplier, which will uh, proportional emit more uh, photons, which finally we will receive it in our user interface on our uh, PC. And with the use of uh, some programs, we can see the final uh, plots of uh, OSL output. 